So we left off here. We are talking about the nitrogenous waste, and we learned that uh, there were four of them, ammonia, urea, uric acid, and creatinine. We learned that urea is the most abundant, and urea comes from uh, the breakdown of proteins, specifically when the amino acids, instead of being recycled, they get used as energy by the mitochondria. Mm. We learned that the ammonia that comes from the breakdown of amino acids gets turned into a somewhat less, yeah, a significantly less to toxic product, urea, by the liver. So that liver dysfunction um, can uh, cause the symptoms of ammonia toxicity. We learned that creatinine comes from the breakdown of creatine phosphate. The more muscle mass a patient has, the more creatine phosphate they have, the more creatine phosphate they have, the more creatinine that they generally will have. Um, one of the things that I alluded to but did not say explicitly was that when we are trying to find out how well a patient's kidneys are working, we primarily will be looking at levels of urea and creatinine on their blood test. As a matter of fact, there is actually a medical term for when levels of urea are too high in a patient's blood, and that term is azotemia. Azotemia, that is the word, that means that this patient's blood levels of urea are too high. Urea levels on a blood test often are blood, urea, nitrogen, or BUN. So when a patient has got azotemia, that actually does not necessarily mean that their kidneys are damaged. Uh, azotemia can also happen because a patient is profoundly dehydrated. For example, if a patient hasn't been able to hold down food and water because of a stomach flu for a while. But it is important, and it's what we're always looking for when we look at our patient's blood test. Then there is this word uremia. Uremia means that our patient has an accumulation of nitrogenous wastes, and they are also becoming sick because of it. Not that their illness has caused the buildup of nitrogenous waste, but the level of waste products in their bloodstream are making them sick. And if you had very high levels of urea and creatinine and ammonia in your blood, you would feel nauseated, you're, you would feel weak, you would have muscle aches and joint aches, and uh, uh, did I say nauseated? Okay, all of that. All right. Oh, here's something that's very important that I meant to mention to you. You can see that in the human body, the liver turns ammonia into urea, right? But when urine is outside of the body or in the urinary bladder, if it gets exposed to bacteria, bacteria will take urea and use it as an energy source. And when bacteria get in touch with urea, they turn it back into ammonia. This is important for a number of reasons. Let's start with the pedestrian. Um, when there is urine that's fresh in your rug because you had a new puppy in your house breaking in, it smells like urine, but it doesn't smell like ammonia. However, if you didn't notice, and if that urine sits there for a few days, it will start to smell stronger and sp stronger. Why? Because bacteria that are there in the carpet will take the urea that was in the pup's urine, turn it into ammonia, and you start smelling ammonia. Okay, that's pedestrian. Here's how it can help you when you are a healthcare provider. The smell of ammonia in a diaper is generally a sign that the diaper has not been changed frequently enough. So one of the things that might be your job is, you know, taking care of new moms with their babies, right? Or it might be your job to take care of elderly patients. Either way, if there is a diaper that you take off of a patient or you can smell that a patient has got a very strong ammonia smell in their diaper, then that's a sign that that diaper has not been changed frequently enough. And it is often a sign of a caregiver or a mom or a dad that's a bit overwhelmed by their tasks and need um, maybe a little bit of TLC and, and extra attention. Um, 
so that's one thing. Another thing is that this can actually happen inside of the urinary bladder of a patient. When there are bacterial infections of the urinary bladder, that problem is called cystitis. Let me just write that down for you. Uh, a while ago, I learned that I should not try to draw, although maybe there's a way to do that, Cis, cystitis. Ah, cystitis. Cystitis is generally, uh, well, it's an inflammation of the bladder, but it's usually a bladder infection. Technically, cystitis can be sterile, but it's usually a bladder infection. If there are bacteria living inside of the bladder and you're young, like perhaps your age, then a bladder infection will cause an inflammation that will make your bladder hurt and will inspire you to urinate very, very frequently. And that actually makes it so that the bacteria that are causing your bladder infection, you're constantly booting them out. However, when people get to be older, um, bladder infections, for reasons we don't understand, very often don't cause that kind of discomfort. So elderly patients can have severe bacterial bladder infections and not complain about having pain when they urinate. Here's what will happen though. The bacteria that are inside of their bladder will take the urea that's in their urine and turn it into ammonia inside of their bladder. And then the ammonia will get reabsorbed into their bloodstream and the elderly patient will start to act like they've suddenly gotten dementia. Right? So if you ever have got an older patient and she seems right as rain most of the time, drives herself to her doctor's appointments, and suddenly one day her, her daughter thinks she's had a stroke or her daughter thinks she's suddenly gotten the Alzheimer's, it could actually be, just be a bacterial bladder infection. How would you diagnose it? You just need a urine sample. Sometimes in elderly patients, their urine can almost look like pus. It's got so many white blood cells in it. And the good news about that is that's the kind of dementia that with IV fluids and a day in the hospital and antibiotics, you can cure, you can cure it. Okay. Now, another thing that you're going to need to know for the final exam are some details about the anatomy of the urinary tract. Now, do I care a whole lot about the renal pelvis and the ureter and the major and the minor calyces? Frankly, no. The part of the urinary tract anatomy that is important is going to be uh, the path of blood flow once blood, blood has gotten into the kidney, so past the renal artery, and the path that fluid will take from the time that it starts up in Bowman's capsule until the time that it goes through the papillary ducts, right? So make sure that you can do that. So there will be questions like, do I have an example? There will be questions like filtrate, just, no, here, this is blood. Blood just left the arcuate artery. Where did it go next? Interlobular or cortical radius. Right? Or blood just left the glomerulus, where did it go next? Efferent arterial. Or blood just left the efferent arterial, where did it go next? Into the paratubular capillaries, right? Also, it could be these the path of fluid flow. Um, one thing you should definitely know is that the fluid that's going to become urine or get reabsorbed by the body, that fluid starts out as filtrate. Why is it filtrate? because it's the product of filtration. So this fluid that comes through a filter is called filtrate. So I might ask you, filtrate just left the proximal convoluted tubule, where did it go next? Descending limb of the nephron, limb, right? So remind yourself of all of this. Um, make sure you focus on the parts before the papillary duct and the blood flow inside of the kidney. Now, let's talk some about the nephron. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. What does that mean? That means that you have got as much um, kidney cleaning power or blood pressure regulating power in your kidney 
as you have functioning nephrons. Luckily, each one of us is usually born with about four times as many nephrons as we absolutely need in order to get the job done. That means a couple of things. It means that people can be living kidney donors. The reason that you can donate your one of your kidneys to your aunt or something like that is because even with only one kidney, as long as that kidney is healthy, you've got twice as many nephrons as you need to get the job done. That's one thing. Another thing it means is that any individual patient of yours can be losing their kidney function, losing their nephrons, but you will not start to see a real change in their kidney function tests until they've lost almost three quarters of their nephrons. Um, my mother-in-law has got high blood pressure and I have told her that she should be very cautious about it and that she should be very diligent with her diet and with her medication and with measuring her blood pressure. And I say one of the reasons is because it can destroy your kidneys. And she will confidently tell me, my doctor says my kidneys are perfect, right? Well, her doctor didn't say that. Her doctor may have said that her kidney function tests are completely normal. But now you know that when a kidney function test is completely normal in a patient with high blood pressure, it really only tells you that they've got at least 25 or 30 percent of their functioning nephrons. What is a nephron? A nephron starts off with the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is Bowman's capsule. Bowen's capsule is also known as the glomerular capsule. Remember the glomerular capsule's got two sides. It's got um, a parietal and a visceral layer. The visceral layer are those podocytes and they are attached to the glomerular capillary bed, which is generally referred to simply as a glomerulus, right? Um, so that's the beginning of a nephron. After that, we've got the proximal convoluted tubule. Why is it called proximal? Proximal means closer to. Now, many of you have probably noticed that the distal convoluted tubule is actually quite close to the Bowman's capsule. Yes, it is. But in the case of how these tubes were named, we're talking about the path that fluid is taking, and fluid will go first into the proximal convoluted tubule, then the nephron loop, and then the distal convoluted tubule. So from the point of view of the road that fluid is taking, the distal convoluted tubule is much farther away. The nephron loop has got two limbs. We usually call them limbs. The descending limb of the nephron loop has one purpose. The ascending limb of the nephron loop, totally different purpose, right? And after that, distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubules of all kinds of nephrons will dump the fluid that they have made into the collecting duct. You know, the nephron is the functioning unit of the kidney. However, the collecting duct is still modifying that fluid that it has been given. So technically, this fluid that's on this journey is not considered urine until it goes through the papillary ducts of the renal papillae of the renal pyramids, right? We will be talking a little bit more about the juxtaglomerular apparatus, but the juxtaglomerular apparatus, it includes juxtaglomerular cells that are sitting right here um, and wrapped around the afferent arterial and mesangial cells and the macula densa. All right, we'll pick up there at the next video.